Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I got to stand up here in front of the camera, right? Or it's not on film now. It doesn't exist. Uh, we're in chapter 29, New Beginnings. Kind of our, it, this, is a, this study, it, as you well kind of realize as you're reading the chapter, it's very broad in scope. Um, kind of, in a sense, covering a lot of what happens in the New Testament um, up to the book of Revelation. And so, um, and, and when we think about that, we're going to talk a little bit about the church. We're going to talk a little bit about Paul, but mostly focusing on the transition that takes place from the Old and the New Testament. And that's going to be the theme that, for instance, the transitioning of Jerusalem being the central place of worship to really the whole world. And the transition from the Jews being the chosen people of God to all people in faith chosen for a specific purpose. Um, well, this is Paul's missionary journey, so, so you'll see, you'll see. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for this day. And dear Lord, as we study what's going on in the new church and how that message from Peter and from Paul reaching the ends of the earth was fulfillment of what our Lord Jesus had said in the very first chapter of the book of Acts, and that is, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth, even Bertrand, as some people call it, the end of the earth. And, and, and we're glad we're here. We wouldn't be anywhere else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is your story. This is my story. Most of all, this is the greatest story ever told. This is God's story. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga and Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. From Perga, they went on to Pisidian Antioch, on the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. After reading from the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them saying, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hands and said, Fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. For whatever reason, I relate most stories I read or things I come across to movies I've seen. When I read this chapter, I immediately thought of the movie Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. The 1987 movie stars Steve Martin, who plays the part of Neil Page, a high-strung advertising executive, and John Candy, who plays the part of an accident-prone shower curtain salesman. I thought when I watched this movie how hard it must be for the person who travels around the country selling shower curtain rings. I would just have, have a hard time getting out of bed every morning for such a job. But hey, someone's got to do it. The two travelers meet in New York City uh, where they share a cab on their way to the LaGuardia Airport. Martin is on his way back home to Chicago to celebrate Thanksgiving with his family. 
They both board the plane, but it is soon rerouted to Wichita due to a blizzard in Chicago. From there, they try trains and rental cars to get back to Chicago, each experience filled with as much frustration as Martin can handle and as many laughs as the viewer can handle. What should have taken an hour and, say, 45 minutes turns into three days. Now, I lived in Chicago for three years, and I've experienced planes, trains, and automobiles to try to get back home. The solution? <laughs> Move to Texas. The character we're going to be introduced to in this chapter will experience far more difficult challenges in his travel than rerouted planes and broken down rental cars. He will be beaten many times, thrown into prison, and eventually beheaded for the extreme commitment to his line of work. His purpose is more lasting and noble than peddling shower curtain rings. His product is free, but it will bring eternal life to all who receive it. And the work didn't pay very well. He had to hold down another job while he was on the road. He made tents. His name? Paul. He is being called upon by God to finish out the commission of Jesus to take the message of salvation to the ends of the earth where mostly Gentiles live. This is not only the commission that Jesus gave the church, but it is part of the promise that God made to Abraham all the way back in chapter 2. He told Abraham that it would be through his offspring that all nations would be blessed. Jesus is that offspring, and Paul is the deliverer of the promise to the nations beyond Israel. Now his home base is a place called Antioch. It is from here that he will take a total of three long journeys that will last somewhere between eight to ten years total. Now, that's a lot of advantage miles. Like Peter, his energy came from the presence of the Holy Spirit in his life. Now on his first visit he established a pattern of starting in the Jewish synagogue in that town and making his pitch. For example, when he was in a city called Pisidian Antioch, he was given the opportunity to speak without an appointment. Paul motioned with his hands, and he said this, The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him they fulfilled the words of the prophet that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in the tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news. What God promised to our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you are not able to obtain under the law of Moses. What's he doing? He's connecting the dots. He's telling them what Peter told the folks in Jerusalem, that the Old Testament scriptures pointed to Christ. Everything that happened to Jesus is foretold in these ancient texts, including everything that would be done to him, even on the cross. Then he connects the dots to what is happening now. He goes for the close by offering up salvation to anyone who believes. They invited him to come back on the next Sabbath to speak again. Word got out, and on the next Saturday, almost the entire population of that city gathered in the synagogue. But as it is with many endeavors in life, the local teachers got jealous and started making trouble for Paul and his traveling companions. When it was all said and done, Paul said to them in the story, We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you rejected and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, where does this quote come from? It comes from Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 6. This plan was in the works from the very beginning. Isaiah was speaking of Paul's mission 700 years before. Paul is simply aligning his life to the upper story of God. However, going to the Gentiles will bring a different challenge. 
he will not be able to give the same message. The Gentiles don't have the same background. They don't know the stories of the Old Testament. They don't have a grand regard for Abraham and Moses. They don't worship Yahweh and aren't looking for a Messiah. They play by a different set of rules. They worship different gods. Paul will need to adjust, and adjust he does. His journey takes him by foot and camel. Martin and Candy never had it so hard. To the great city of Athens, he had to find his angle. It couldn't have anything to do with the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he noticed on the altar a statue to the unknown God. They were so unsure who the true God was, they had a statue made to the one they might have missed. Paul brilliantly and eloquently starts at the beginning with creation. From there he leads them to the discovery that behind this creation is the one true God who is revealed in Jesus. Some thought it was a clever argument and nodded. Some laughed, but some believed. Paul's message was radically changing the lives of people in every city he went. This challenged the status quo, which makes people uptight. Many people stopped attending worship at the synagogues and pagan temples and started attending a little house church that Paul helped start. Contributions went down. His journeys took him for a two-year stay in Ephesus, the home of the temple of Artemis, the Greek name for the Roman goddess Diana. He started out for the first three months in the Jewish synagogues, but they were being far too obstinate for Paul. He moves his lectures to the hall of Tyrannus, which gave him a great audience with the Gentiles. Over that two-year period, many Jews and Gentiles came to faith in Christ. It was literally changing not only the spiritual climate of Ephesus, but the financial climate. A number of people who trusted Christ, who in their past life practiced sorcery, brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. The calculated value? 50,000 drachmas, which I estimate at $4 million by our standards today. The story simply tells us, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. The upper story call on Paul's life was to take the gospel the distance, to the ends of the earth. By God's grace and through the strength of the Holy Spirit, he did just that. He planted numerous churches in the highly Gentile populated cities. He wrote 13 letters to help strengthen churches throughout the world, which are contained in our Bibles today. Some of you studying through the story are Jewish. The good news was rightfully brought to your people first. Your ancestors brought us Christ. But I bet most of you are like me, a Gentile, which simply means you're not Jewish. The gospel has come to us because Paul was obedient to be the first to bring it to us. He courageously took up the upper story call of God on his life. That, that's how the, they stop working after a while. Well, how come my plug-in cord's not working anymore? Well, when you step on it and try and lift it. Connecting, connecting, yes. Connecting to your device. Connecting to your device. Device is ready to go. That's what you say. There we go. Okay. All right. So I like this painting. This painting was painted in um, somewhere around the 1500s, and it's 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 just a painting of Paul. Um, we don't know what Paul looked like. We don't have any pictures of him. Although my favorite story comes from a lecture that Luther did. It was you know he was a he was a teacher, so he did a lot of lecturing for would be priests, and someone had asked him. Apparently, the lecture hall was very, it, it, especially later on in his life, he was becoming such a celebrity. 
his lectures were just packed. It wasn't just students. People from all around came. And they asked him, you know, uh, Dr. Luther, what did the Apostle Paul look like? And, and he said, well, he's, he was likely a short guy, a uh, short, ugly-looking guy like Philip here. And Philip Melanchthon was one of his good friends and reformers, a short, ugly guy like Philip here, right, and, and bald. Um, and so, you know, as, as we talked about last week, that Acts is really folk, it's a book of transition. Um, Peter kind of fades in, by chapter 8, and Paul takes center stage. The focus of the gospel moves from Jew to Gentile. The focus of worship moves from Jerusalem out to the ends of the earth. And, uh, and we know that for many of the disciples, this, this preaching came at a steep price. Uh, Eleven of the twelve gospels died at the hands of, of people, uh, of enemies of the gospel. John died of old age, but he still suffered and was, was, was punished for his, uh, for his preaching. And, and then we get to Paul. And after Paul's conversion, and, and this is a, a point I think we miss sometimes, after Paul's conversion, he didn't start his missionary work for 14 years. 14 years. And, and I think it's a reminder for us that um, although, you know, we, we would never control God's spirit, <laughs> and, 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 but oftentimes, you know, any missionaries that are sent out from churches, they go through a lot of study and preparation. There's a reason for that because it's not easy. Um, and Paul had a basic um, of the 10 or so churches he founded. When he would go into a city, he had a, uh, he had a order. He would go in the synagogues first and preach until he couldn't stand it any longer, and then he would leave the synagogue and go. In fact, a number of times he says, I'm never coming back, and the next day he'd be back in the synagogue, right? Um, but his message didn't change, and that uh, he could reason from the scriptures for the Jews but understand, right, when he's talking to Gentiles, to pagans, he couldn't reason from Scripture to them. They could care less what the prophet Isaiah spoke about. And, and so his message was very different depending on his audience. Um, and, and this was something that he had proclaimed, that the cross was, he said, the cross represents this for the Gentiles and this for the Jews. Do you remember For the Jew, the cross is a stumbling block. It's almost like they, keep, they get the gospel message up to the point to the cross, and that's where they stop. For the Gentile, it's foolishness. That everything he says is foolish. And, and which, which leads me and, and many other people to believe we are really living in a time much like the first century. Because think about if Paul's in the synagogue and all of the people there are Jews, he doesn't have to talk to them about they, they understand who Yahweh is. They understand what sin is. They understand what the law is. So, of course, he's going to preach Christ and the fulfillment of that. To Gentiles, he, he has to take a different approach. And, you know, uh, in the video, we lifted up that example of him um, using the unknown God, and that was interesting. In a Roman city, in order to have a God, a permitted God in the, in the marketplace, you had to fill out a form, basically. You had to go to the city clerk and say, okay, I want to register this new God. And interestingly, uh, in order to register a God, the God had to be able to provide something to the community, um, and, and which was, of course, of course, this. So they had an altar to an unknown God in case they missed one. And so Paul used that in his great speech, and he said, look, you have an altar to the unknown God. I'm going to tell you who that unknown God is, and in fact, he is the God, the one true God, and he goes on to preach. He didn't have to use that method with Jews. He, he, would, he would appeal to them from the Scripture, which I think in our own evangelism, and, and we do this as well, and maybe it's not so um, purposeful, but when you're, when you're speaking to someone who's maybe been a Christian their whole life, whereas you're speaking to someone who knows nothing about the church and nothing about Christ, we have a little different approach, and, and that's exactly what Paul did. Um, and Paul's letters to the churches, which make up m much of the New Testament, um, and what it is is his letters, for the most part, reveal... Uh, 
something just happened. Okay, I'll see if that worked. I'm revealed that in each instance, the churches were dealing with different issues, which, which remind us that there's not one set model that works for every single church. Um, for, the, for the Corinthians, right, their problem was they were wanting to embrace their old sinful lifestyle in view of saved by grace through faith. That was, right, I'm saved and I can do whatever I want. That was kind of the Corinthian mindset. Um, the Thessalonians were so believing that Jesus was going to come back in their time frame and they were really suffering more than any other Christian body that they had kind of stopped their everyday lives, stopped working and praying and, I mean, not stopped praying, they stopped working and just said, we're just going to spend all our time in church because Jesus is coming back. And Paul said, no, 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 don't do that. You've got other things to do. The Galatians, the Galatians were uh, really a, a, a region of churches and unfortunately, someone, Paul had founded these churches in the region of Galatia, and then they're not named, but two Jewish Christians followed behind him and basically said this, well, Paul preached to you that faith in Christ saves you. He was partly right. You have to follow Jewish customs, of course. You know, that's the part he missed. And, and Paul, and so they started incorporating that into their worship. So Paul writes Galatians, and he says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And, and it seems so, so easy. And, and, not, and, and, and it doesn't even seem like a big deal, does it, to say, look, I'm saved by faith, but certainly the things I do contribute to salvation in some way. It's so tempting, but yet, as Paul says, when we add to the gospel anything, we distort the whole gospel. Then it stops being good news. So, in each, and to Romans, Paul never visited the church in Rome until he was under arrest. But Romans, which we're going to start studying in three weeks in depth, I'm very excited. Um, that was sort of his, his, that's why the book of Romans is so long. It's almost his summary of everything he's going to do and teach and preach to them in Rome. And he did arrive in Rome, but it was under chains. And so in chapter 29, uh, you know, that Chris Tomlin song, uh, Jesus Messiah, it's a great song, a great theology. A, a reminder that there are great contemporary songs for those, for those of us who only like music from the 17th century, right? And in this, he, he became sin who knew no sin that we may become his righteousness. That lyric from that song comes right out of the preaching of Paul. That for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. That's the message Paul is preaching. For the Jew, he jumps right to that. For the Gentile, he goes back a little bit. Even back to creation. You know, there was one God who created the heavens and the earth. There's one God who created them male and female. Something our culture needs to hear over and over again. And there's one God who sent his son who became sin, who knew no sin, so that we could become the righteousness. And, and some have called this the, the, the mighty transaction. What, in general, what's a transaction? An exchange. I, I show up to Kroger and I have my strawberries and, 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 and whiskey and milk. And I, you know, I can't just walk out of the store. I have to pay for it in some way. So I go to the self-serve thing and it never works, right? It never works, and you always have to wait to someone to come over and to help you anyway. And so um, um, some theologians have called it the, the, the great transaction, and that is this, that God the Father looked upon the sacrifices of his son Jesus and said, this sacrifice is sufficient, all sufficient, full payment for everyone's sins. But here's the deal, and this is where, and I appreciate it, and I think there's a reason for this, each, we'll just say, denomination or church tradition has a different way of, of communicating this transaction. But however we want to communicate it, that in order for this transaction to be made, it needs to, we need to apply it to ourselves. In order for us to be forgiven, to come with a relationship with the living God, we need to receive it. We need to receive this gift. And, you know, our parents can't do it for us. Our spouse can't. Uh, our, our pastor. And it, this, is, this transaction happens between the believer and Christ himself in faith. 
And uh, the question then is, who is God going to get to make this message of Jesus known to everybody? Um, and of course, that becomes the church. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it, that each one of us is a living member of the church. Every one of us. One role, no more important than the other role, because we know as a body works, right, it works together. If one part of the body isn't working, then the body doesn't work. And, and what's interesting is, too, in Christianity, a, this was a new way of interacting with God. It wasn't just prayers and that. It was entering into a personal relationship with Christ. And that's not something that had been focused on in, in religion necessarily. Your prayers were sent out and everything, but God was always distant. But now in Christ, when, in, and little kids understand this, Jesus lives in my heart. They get it. They get that. We get older, well, how can someone live in someone's heart? And that doesn't, in my heart, I have a blockage in the, the anterior descending in the back anyway, so my heart's not doing well. It's Jesus lives in, in the goal, right? The goal of the saved, meaning those of us who have received that free gift of salvation, is to develop as close as a relationship with Christ as we can throughout our life. Again, not to earn salvation because we already have it. And as the body of Christ, what do we do? Well, we show Christ to the world. I think most importantly, by our very lives. Just how we live our lives. You could, you could in your whole life never preach to someone. One, because not all call, people are called to preach. But a lot of people do preach, and that's great. But it's how we live our lives. I think that's the most important witness. And, and we do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, we've already learned in the very first chapter of Acts that Jesus, um, when he commissioned the disciples right before his ascension, said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And really, that's where Paul jumps in the story. That's where Paul jumps in the story. Now, the first time we're introduced to Paul in the book of Acts, he's not center stage. He's on the sidelines. And it was in the stoning of Stephen, if you remember. And Paul of Tarsus is mentioned. And when Stephen is being executed, what is Paul doing? He's holding their coats. Why, why, is, he, is, why is he holding his coat? Is he just being a nice coat check guy? That's right. In his mind, and in, 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 in people who were, this is letter of the law people, as long as you didn't get blood on you, you weren't unclean. Didn't matter you were murdering someone. That getting so, um, oh my goodness, I don't want to get blood on my cloak while I murder this person because I don't want to be unclean, right? So Paul, who had probably um, arranged the whole thing, stood to the side holding the colts while they executed Stephen. And do you remember Stephen's words as he died? He, he said the same thing Christ said on the cross. Forgive them for they know not what they do, you know? Um, that can only be done, I believe, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, Tim. Yeah, when, when, when God says to Cain, where is your brother? And he's like, I don't know. And he says, his blood is crying. Yeah, well. And so Paul summarizes his mission um, in Romans chapter 1, and this is what he writes. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Full stop. That's it. It is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. We don't need to add anything more to that. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written. From first, meaning to Jew to Gentile, the righteous will live by faith. So now this righteousness is not something you earn by good living. It's something that is granted to you by Christ by faith. 
And to pull this off, God chose, perhaps, well, from the lower story perspective, the worst person he could have picked to be this new messenger of the gospel to the Gentiles. And he picked someone who, what was Paul doing before he had his... He was arresting and executing and persecuting Christians. I mean, think about it. Could there be a worse person to choose? And, and I'll tell you, um, there, there's many clues in it. Uh, when he, after his conversion and he struck blind, do you remember who the disciple was God chose to bring his sight back to him? Ananias, that's right. And that's the only mention we get of Ananias. He was living across the street and God comes to Ananias and says, I want you to go across the street. And, and find this guy Paul and pray over him and he'll receive his sight. And he's like, wait a minute. This is the guy who's been arresting and killing us. And God says, don't worry about vengeance. I will deal with that. He's going to suffer for what he's done. But do so anyway. And he does. Paul restores his sight. And then 14 years later begins his missionary journeys, bringing the gospel. Um, and, and so this is just kind of a map, I, I don't know how well you can see it, of Paul's three missionary journeys. He always starts off in Antioch, and Antioch is interesting. Uh, many people call this the first kind of megachurch, right? This was the first, and megachurches are defined, I think, as, as churches that worship more than a thousand people a week or two thousand, something like that. St. Martin, we're categorized as a small to medium size church based on. And so his first missionary journey, his second, third, and fourth. And then the last one was Paul's uh, journey to Rome where he hung around here and then after a shipwreck uh, headed to Rome where he spent the last years of his life, two years imprisoned. Um, in the, in what many believe accompanied by Luke, he was under kind of house arrest, so he was able to, to move about, but he was still under arrest until his eventual beheading um, in 64 AD. Uh, that's about the time frame. Yes, that's exactly right. Insurrection. That he was causing a public disturbance, um, disturbing... And, you know, that's such a vague term that's been used to execute people throughout cultures and time. Um, you're, you're rocking the boat too much and unacceptable. So that was why. So. Um, and so Paul embark, embarks on these three missionary journeys, uh, places like Ephesus and Troas, Troas and Corinth and Thessalonica and Philippi, um, starting 10 church areas anyway. Uh, the author of 13 or 14 books of the New Testament. Ephesians is a little disputed whether or not Paul wrote it or not. I, I believe he did, but um, I would say more liberal theologians says, well, it doesn't match exactly his writing style and other books. But I don't know, I've read a lot of authors who write, you know, uh, uh, Stephen King, for example, writes horror books, but he also writes fantasy books, and, and he wrote The Green Mile. And so, I don't know, it doesn't matter, Right even though Paul said I wrote it, <laughs> which is why I believe it. And, uh, and, and then that brings us up to Acts chapter 15, and this is a, a, another transitional part in the early church. This is known as the Jerusalem Council, the first big gathering of, of church leaders where they have to um, deal with disputes. You know, we're humans, right? When you start bringing the gospel across the world to different cultures, you're going to run into some issues that you have to deal with. Um, polygamy, uh, uh, eating meat to other gods, um, the relationship between a husband and a wife, how to raise children, all of these things in light of the gospel can become a controversy. But the big one, the big one was that many of the Jewish leaders were telling Christians to become Christian, you have to be a Jew first and then receive Christ by faith. And Paul hears of this and he says, I'm heading to Jerusalem. Uh-uh. And they have a big dispute. On one side, you have James, the brother of uh, James and Peter, against Paul, kind of. And, and James and Peter are arguing, yes, they need to become Jew first. And Paul's saying, no, no, that we're saved by faith. And if we, we 
Faith is, is another way to translate faith is trust. If we trust that promise, then that's what we live. And so they came to an agreement. They said, okay. Yep, they said, you're right. Um, we're going we're gonna to preach that salvation comes only through faith. But we're going to encourage the faithful to continue following uh, dietary laws and, and morality laws and that. Which, which Paul was fine with. And which the church today, of course, is fine with as well. Because the gospel doesn't start with moral living. It starts with the, with, with the good news. But the law comes after the gospel. And, and as, as we read in the book of Revelation, woe to those churches that excise the law completely. These are the churches. This was Corinth's problem. This is the problem I, I, I uphold in many Christian churches today, which is once saved, it doesn't matter what you do. So go ahead and, and practice your homosexuality. Um, have multiple partners. Um, abortion is fine. What we're, do you see how removing the law from the word of God has consequences? And one of the consequences we're seeing is the shrinking of the church. Um, the gospel doesn't start with the law, but we don't get rid of the law. And that reminder we get today on Pentecost. Um, you know, Pentecost is when the Spirit came down and resided on the heads, and some people believe the mouths of the disciples. And what form did it take? Fire. Fire is always a sign of purification and of refining. That idea that, that in, in the power of the Spirit coming upon us is also the power of purification. Not that we achieve it perfectly, but there's a big difference, right, between saying something like, look, I struggle with my sexuality. I struggle with it. There's a difference between saying that and saying, um, I struggle with my sexuality and, and it's a good thing. It's a good thing that I indulge these things that the Bible clearly, clearly says we are not to indulge in. Two separate things. And that, I see, is the big difference between what, what I'll call liberal Christianity and more orthodox Christianity. You know, God wouldn't create us with these inclinations if he didn't want us to indulge them. That's what's behind it, right? But we all have, we all have our own individual things we struggle with. Um, and they're not the same. Some with sexuality, some with substances, some with greed, some with anger. I mean, we all got our thing, right? But what does God say about temptation? That no temptation will come to you. That, see, that's right. There's always a way out of temptation. And so uh, Paul comes back and, and they come to this agreement and they say that's, that's fine. And so really this is where Paul is kind of crowned anyway, the, um, the evangelist to the Gentiles. He wasn't the only one. There were many others. Peter did a lot of preaching to the Gentiles too. But really, this is Paul's main mission, to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, to the rest of the world. And have you ever thought about this, that the book of Acts is still being written today, in a sense? What I mean by that is that the history of the church is still going on. It's still going on. Because we have the same commission on our lives as the first disciples had on theirs and that is to be witnesses to Christ. And I'm very excited because really the book of Romans, and I'll warn you ahead of time, Romans is in a sense very clinical, very detail-oriented. Or I think the book of Romans um, appeals to the scientific mind because it's very specific. Uh, you're going to find it's very organized for the, the real visionary people out there they sometimes have a hard time with the specific details we're going to be going in the book of Romans. But again, Paul wrote Romans as an overall summary of the message he was going to be sending uh, when, when he got to Rome. Um, and uh, believe and you will be saved. That's the gospel. That's it. Believe and you will be saved. Um, and it was Paul's mission to deliver that message and that's our mission as well. That Paul's mission is our mission. And what is our call? To live Christ-filled lives, to invite, 
to seek out the suffering and to be Christ's witnesses to the ends of the earth. Our call is no different than Paul's was. Amen. Well, we got two more weeks with the story, and then we will be uh, starting in the book of Romans. So I would say now would be a good time maybe to read the first couple chapter of Romans. I think it's going to be important as we do this study. It will really help. And I'll give you a study guide ahead of time to know what to read. But to read through the chapters before we get to it. I mean, it only takes to read a chapter. It doesn't take that long. You could read the whole book of Romans in about a half an hour, right? But the problem is you got to stop and pay it. It's, it's even one sentence. Paul doesn't, uh, he doesn't like periods. And in fact, in the Greek, you have some, some chapters that are just one long sentence. We'd call them run-on sentences in English, but apparently in Greek, they, they didn't like periods as much as we do in exclamation points and colons. So, yeah, Tim. Ah. Yeah. Son of man, where that understanding is Jesus is Yeah, oh, so Tim had mentioned Oswald Chambers in, in, in looking at the titles Jesus had, which is Son of God and Son of Man. And Son of God, of course, especially in John's Gospel, is how John refers to him. But Jesus, in referencing himself, it was almost always Son of Man. Son of Man. And, and that's right, because you remember in John's Gospel, he said, no longer do I call you servant but I call you friend and why because the friend knows what the father says the servant doesn't so I don't call you servants anymore but we're friend let us pray heavenly father we thank you for your word we ask you dear lord to give us diligence in the study of your word so that we can be the best witnesses in this dark world in Jesus name we pray amen